ערב טוב רבותיי, ברוכים הבאים, ערב שבת קודש, פרשת ויחי. It's great to see you as every week. ברוך השם, we are having the zechut to learn Torah together. And this week, בעזרת השם, we are going to complete פרשת ויחי, to complete חומש בראשית, with all the rich... Beautiful, magnificent, powerful, and profound messages we'll learn throughout the entire Homash Bereshit. And I have to admit, and I would love to share it, I think of Botai, it's clear to understand that even that if any of us make a belief to ourselves that going through Homash Bereshit in the pace that we went through, And we believe we know Humash Bereshit, we have to think again. Because there are so many, so many messages, mehilat, messages that we can and should learn from the Torah, from Humash Bereshit, that is always great. And it's even mutar to go back to Bereshit, Noah, Lech Lecha, even though we already uh, in Kiryat Torah. actually completing the, the Humash. Nevertheless, Rabbotai, I think it's true to say that there are many, many parents and many rabbis and many leaders of a community are sometimes carrying a little frustration that they feel that they have an enormous wisdom In their life because of age because of experience us as parents or anybody who is trying to convey a message and to teach a lesson we have a feeling quite often that it's so sad that the children or the young generation are not open enough to listen to what we have to say We feel sometimes as parents or as leaders, teachers, you name it, we feel that we have earned and we have accumulated so much knowledge and information and wisdom from, you know, from learning and from uh, experience, life experiences and, and what we have witnessed by great hachamim before us. And we want to share it with the young generation and we feel that they are not there you know, ready and prepared to, to listen to that. However, as sad as it may sound, we know that there are situations that when people do share a piece of information, the listeners are paying very, very close attention. It's very sad. that it's almost only, or at least very powerful, under those circumstances. But we know that when a person is about, has v'shalom, to depart from the world, when somebody's about to die, and a father calls his children, and he is telling them, look, before I go, I want to share with you something. As sad as it is, probably sound, I think it's easy to admit that under those circumstances, people do tend to listen. There are many people who use words of wisdom, pearls of wisdom, their parents and rabbis and teachers, and they say, before he passed away, that's what he told me, that's what he said to me. So I'm keeping it with me. This is his will to me. This is the tzavah that I'm keeping. For some obvious reasons, those moments are very profound moments that we do listen. As we all know, and I opened the Gemara here, Masechet Berecho, the Gemara said, Kishihala Rabbi Eliezer, when Rabbi Eliezer Gadol, Rabbo Shah Rabbi Akiva, when he became sick, And the students of Rabbi Eliezer Gadol realized that it might be the last moments of Rabbi Eliezer. Gemara said, Nikhnesu Talmidav Levakro, the students of Rabbi Eliezer Gadol came to visit him. But obviously, they did not just come to visit, they came to learn. 
אמרו לו רבנו, וסה תוהים רבנו, ילמדנו אורחות חיים ונזכה בהן לחיי העולם הבא. Can you please teach us the way of life? So we will have the zechut to earn and to gain olam abba by those orchot ha'im, the ways, the proper ways of life. Amar lahem, and he told them, Izaru b'chvod haverchem, u'min'u b'nechem in ahigayon, v'oshivu m'birkei talmidei hachamim, u'chashatem b'tpalelim, d'au l'fnei miyatem omdim, u'bishvil kach t'zku l'chaye olam abba. I'm on purpose not going into all the details of what he told him. When he told him, just in general translation, you shall be very careful on the honor and respect of your friends. Meaning when you teach your children Torah, do not just teach them the simple understanding of the text, but rather but rather go deep into the meaning of the words, if you care for your kids, you should put them on the, on the birkaim of Talmidei Hachamim, meaning put them on the laps of Talmidei Hachamim, which means make sure that the environment your kids are around are Talmidei Hachamim. When you pray to a Kadosh Baruch Hu, Shaharit, Minha, and Arvit, just make sure that you are Paying attention, just keep in mind who you are standing up in front and make sure that this is your intention to pray to a Kadosh Baruch And for that, you will have the Hayat Amaba, honest. And the truth is, we can go into those four messages in very, very much deep depth. But this is not the point now. The point being is, Abel Ezer Gadol was teaching Torah to thousands of students their entire lives. And the Gemara said, when they came to him, they came to visit him right before he passed away. They came to him and they said, Teach us the proper ways of life. And I can imagine Rabbi Eliezer Gadol looking at them and said, and what have I, what have I have done up until now? Now you want to learn what happened to everything I taught you up until now. So obviously there is a very special moment. There is very special power to the moments before Rabbi Eliezer Gadol is going back to Borei Ola. Before he goes, obviously there is a special meaning, meaning to this moment that he is going to share with them Orochot Haim. And also, obviously, at that moment, he can just put in a deepest concentration way, in a very, very concentrating way, in a laser beam form, what's the Orochot Haim, like what's the gist of the teaching of Abel Yazir Gedul. But we all know that in those kind of moments, we do pay attention. And we do tend to remember the words that we are told and obviously to take them to practice in life. In Parashat Vayahi, Rabbotai, when Torateno HaKedoshah is going to tell us the story of Yaakov Avinu Alev Shalom Behir Avot, when Yaakov Avinu is going to Go back to Borei Olam. The Torah said, "Vayehi Yaakov be'eretz Mitzrayim sheva esrei shana. Vayehi me Yaakov shene hayav sheva shani ve'arbaim u'mat shana." So basically, basically, this is the time. This is the moment that Yaakov Avinu is about to go. Is about to go back to Borei Olam. La'hazir nishmato betahara. And right before Yaakov Avinu is leaving, I think this is very proper for us to pay attention, very, very, very close attention to what Yaakov Avinu is saying to his children and what are his will 
his will desires what is Yaakov Avinu is emphasizing what is he requesting how is he requesting because those messages of Botai can lead us to live life in a completely different dimension it can support us in living life in a completely different level and Be'ezrat Hashem this is the goal of tonight to go into this a little bit as much as possible as much as time allow us yeah we have about a little less than an hour so when we're gonna go through those messages we have a chance to to adapt some of them to lead us to a beautiful and powerful life the first thing that I want to pay attention to and I, and I have to yeah I want to I don't want to use the word warn you but prepare you that some of the questions we're gonna deal with might not be so easy to digest but nevertheless let's try what is the first thing Yaakov Avinu is doing Yaakov Avinu is about to go Yaakov Avinu is about to go and this pasuk deserves hours of conversation but the bottom line is Yaakov Avinu does not want to be buried in Egypt. Yaakov Avinu does not want to be buried in Eretz Amim. He wants and he command, commanded Yosef HaTzadik as the man in power in Egypt to take him to Eretz Israel. I don't want to die. I, I, want to, I mean, I don't want to be buried here. Take me home. By the way, in parentheses, I don't want to get into details. But for those of us who live in America or in any other place in the world outside of Eretz Israel, we should know, it's important to mention, it is very, very important. It's very important to live in Eretz Israel. It's very important to spend the entire life in Eretz Israel. And that's another topic. But nevertheless, even if some people did not have the zikhut to live in Eretz Israel, it is very important to make sure that we are being buried in Eretz Israel. Kiddushat Eretz Israel, it's a big topic, but I'm just mentioning that because it's in the Pasuk. So Yaakov Avinu is approaching Yosef and he said, I want you to swear, I want you to be nishba, that you're going to take me to Eretz Israel. Al natik bereni b'mitzrayim. Granted, simple. V'shachavtim avotai, v'satani b'mitzrayim, v'satani b'mitzrayim. And Yosef HaTzadik said, Abba, million percent. I will do, I will fulfill your will. I will do whatever you ask me. Now, if we stop here for a moment, it might sound sufficient. Obviously, the level of trust Yaakov Avinu had in Yosef was 100%. And Yaakov Avinu goes to Yosef and he said, please do not bury me in Egypt. And Yosef said, Anuchi, Abba, don't you worry. Anuchi, I will do whatever you want. Sounds great. Apparently it was not sufficient for Yaakov Avinu. Now I want you to swear. Oh, you don't trust me? I don't know. Just in case. Big topic. Big topic. As Hachamim said, Te'ala be'idne sagidle lo nikanes. This is the time by Yishtahu Yisrael al Rosham Bita. So we know that Yaakov Avinu is asking Yosef to bury him in Eretz Yisrael. Yosef committed himself. That was not sufficient for Yaakov Avinu. And Yaakov Avinu asked Yosef, swear. Now, Yaakov Avinu is giving a speech to Yosef. Botai, it's a, it's a shocking point, really shocking point. It's almost impossible to comprehend how difficult this pasuk is. And Yaakov Avinu continued to say, let's, let's pay attention to this. He's telling him a story. And and I want you to know that your sons, which are my grandkids, are getting an upgrade. 
Now they become their equivalent to my own sons. Wonderful gift. And then Yaakov Avinu is continually telling Yosef a story. A history. And Yosef said Yaakov, do you know my dear son? When I was on my way from Padan, Rahel, your mother, passed away. Meta alay Rahel, Beiretz Kenan, on my way to Efrat, and I had to bury her there in Bethlehem. I had to bury her there in Bethlehem. Whatever, Rabbi, all the Hachamim, all the Mefarshim on the Torah are asking, why is Yaakov Avinu telling yourself the story? That he buried Rahel in Bethlehem. What is has to do with Yaakov's request? Al-Natik Bereni Bemitzrayim. If it was not written, it, was be, it would have been a scary, scary point to mention. Said Rashi, Wow. Va'ani bevo'i mi padan, Yaakov Avinu is insinuating a very powerful message to Yosef. He's telling him, Ve'af al pish ani matriach alecha. Le'olicheni li'ikavir b'eretz kena. And even though I'm bothering you so much to make an enormous effort to bury me in Eretz Kena'an, Ve'lo kach asiti le'imcha. And I didn't do what I'm asking you to do for me. I didn't do myself to your mother. Because she passed away next to Bethlehem. Please do not be upset at me. The Ibn Ezra, Alav Shalom, saying the same exact point, but in a little bit stronger words. Yaakov somehow is apologizing to Yosef and he said, אני בבואי מפדן שמתה רחל פתאו ולא יכולתי להוליכה לקוברה במערה ואמר זה ליוסף and he's telling that to יוסף למה שלא יחר לך שאבקש מאיתך מה שלא עשיתי לכבוד אמך so I don't want you said Yaakov I don't want you to be upset at me I know I'm asking you to bury me in Eretz Israel and not in Egypt and I know it's a long journey it's a long process to do but please do not be upset at me that I didn't do it. Let me explain to you why I wasn't able to do it to your mother, Rahel, alayhi shalom. Moreover, Rabbutai, if we really brave enough to take a deep breath on this pasuk, it's quite scary. What is Yaakov Avinu saying? What is Yaakov Avinu saying? He is placing a request with Yosef at Tzaddiki's son. And he said, please do not bury me in Egypt, bury me in Eretz Israel. Is there any doubt Yosef HaTzadik is going to do it? Absolutely no doubt. Yosef with all his heart is going to do it, no question. Yaakov Avinu is requesting a swear, a shivua, and Yosef HaTzadik is swearing, no problem. But Yaakov Avinu feels that there is a need of an explanation, of a clarification. All the points of explanation of Yosef. Please do not hold back from doing what I'm asking you. As has shalom, a point of anger. Why I didn't do it to your mother. Moreover, Botai, I'm holding my breath and I'm asking myself a very simple question. I hope it's a proper question. Why was Yaakov Avinu feels that he needs to say to Yosef, is there any possibility that Yosef HaTzadik HaKadosh VeHatahor 
בין הזיכונים בחיר הבנים של יעקב אבינו. Is there a possibility that יוסף הצדיק הקדוש והטהור would hear the request of his father יעקב and he is going to go into the חשבונות He is going to do all kinds of calculations and say, wait a second, Abba. You want me to bury you in Eretz Yisrael, Me'arat HaMachpela, sounds like a nice request. However, I have a difficulty in doing this. Abba, I'm still carrying a pain and an anger and I, I, I am questioning you. Why? You want me to do what you didn't do to my mother and because you didn't do it to my mother... But there is a question and I'm not doing I'm not gonna do it are we talking about people in our generation are we talking about us are we talking about people that are doing all kinds of hedge bonot you did not invite me to the wedding of your of your daughter I'm not gonna invite you to the wedding of my son and I'm not gonna do this because you didn't do this this is a this is a great conversation in people amongst us in our generation but is that the A concern Yaakov Avinu had about Yosef? Obviously, if Yaakov Avinu said that, he definitely believed that that point of pain is sitting in a very, very strong place in Yosef's heart. And maybe he... Well, be me'akev the kivura of Yaakov Avinu because he has a hishbon, he has an open account with him. You didn't do this to my mother. So that definitely requires a very, very close attention. Baruch ata Adonai. Eloheinu melech ha'olam she'akol nihiyah b'dvom. Genius, the one who created coffee. Genius. We're going to leave this question for the moment and we're going to go to another part of the parasha. As a quick introduction to this, Abbotai, I know that there are many, many of us, many people in the world have this weird tendency, very strange desire. To go to some people who might be able to tell them the future. Magide atidot. Lipah ruham shel mehashvei chesim. Katu begemara. There are many, many people that feels very attractive to go to the people who claim, and I'm using the word claim because this is a completely false word. place to go but they like to go to those kind of people and we have all kinds of them they have different names from whatever mediums and, and people who are communicating with all kinds of forces and people like to go to them and ask them for any kind any piece of information about what going to happen in their future. And yes, it's not only in the general world, it's happened to us too. There are many people who are going to some people that call themselves Hachamim Yodea Aitim, that in many, many cases we have to be extremely careful and to run away as fast as possible from them. But there are people that, you know, will pay money to just to get any piece of information, what's going to happen in their future. Are they going to get married? When and with who? Who? Where is their brides? As if you're talking about Nevi'im, which is completely Nevi'ish Sheker 100%. But people have the tendency, and when you pay attention to this, why people want that, there are many explanations to that. Many people believe that if they will know the future, they might have the ability to control the future, or to have a say about the future, or maybe prevent if the future is not what they want, etc., There is all kind of La La Land, illusionary, illusionary business that people like to be curious to know their future. There are a lot of other sicknesses, but this is one of them. 
And while those people are providing a completely false info, completely false. Not they're, they're not nevi'e shikir, they're nonsense. I have a friend of mine who just came to me two weeks ago and told me that he saw this people that they're asking questions of all kinds of metakshirim and mediums and that. And he said to me, isn't it Avodah Zarah? It's terrible, it's Avodah Zarah. I said to him, relax, this is not Avodah Zarah. This is Bamikre Atov in the best case scenario is Avodah Bainaim. It's Avodah Bainaim, not Avodah Zarah. It's, it's a waste of, of money and a waste of time and a waste of energy and a waste of false beliefs. Nevertheless, Rabbutai, while those people are completely false, we do know that in this week parasha, Parashat Vayahi, we're going to read this Shabbat Be'ezrat Hashem. No other than Yaakov Avinu Alav Shalom made that promise to his sons. Before Yaakov Avinu passed away, Yaakov Avinu said in the Torah, Parashat Vayahi, the parasha we're going to read this Shabbat, Perik Memtet, Pasuk Alev, Vayikra Yaakov El Banev. Yeah. Yaakov Avinu is calling his sons, Vayomer, and he tells them, He'asefu ve'agida lachem et asher ikra etchem be'aharit ha'yamin. Gather together, and I will tell you. You listen to the words, I will tell you. Said Yaakov Avinu, this is not false. This is Yaakov Avinu, Kodesh Kodashim, making that strong promise to the brothers, to his sons, I'm going to tell you et asher ikra etchem be'aharit hayamim. I'm going to share with you your future. I'm going to share with you your atid, what's going to happen to you. Do you guys want to hear it? Of course. So Yaakov Avinu made... A very strong promise to his sons that he's going to tell them their future. It's very, very powerful when it comes from Yaakov Avinu, especially in the moments before he passed away. And this is the time that the brothers are gathering together, fully excited, ready and prepared to get the news, to get the future news. From Yaakov Avinu, Kodesh Kodashim. This is not, you know, Magide Atidot Bar Minan. This is Yaakov Avinu. He's going to tell them the future. And they're listening. They're listening very carefully. And Yaakov Avinu started. He called Reuven, Ta'alhon, come here. Reuven Bechoriata. Reuven bechori ata kohi vereshit oni yeter se'et veyeter az. Now, again, as always, I keep mentioning that it's not enough. It's not even 2% of learning Torah by listening to any shi'u in the world. We need to go word by word and to understand the holy words of Yaakov Avinu. But we don't have the time now, so I'm going to make it in my own words, more or less, for the main part. But I still want to encourage every single one of us, this Shabbat, when it comes to Beta Knesset, or even at home on Friday before Shabbat, go into the words, look on the Pesukim, look on Rashi Kadosh and Eben Ezra, and Orahim Kadosh and all the commentaries on the Torah, because every single word has tremendous, tremendous depth of meaning. פחז כמים על תותר, כי עלית משכבי אביך, אז חיללת יצוי עלה. So Yaakov Avinu is looking at Reuven, is giving him the rebuke, the tochecha. אז חיללת יצוי עלה, פחז כמים על תותר. You are a person that made a mistake by doing what you're doing with, with חילופי המיטות from, from בלהה to אוהל לאה. You got involved in my life planning. You are a very, very paziz. 
You are not thinking before you're doing things. Pahas Kamayim Maltotar and he's giving him a lecture of who he is. Then he continues, Ruven, move aside, Shimon and Levi, come here. Shimon and Levi are coming and they thought they are heroes because they saved Dina. They killed the entire city of Shechem. Yaakov Avinu is probably going to praise them and he's going to give them their future. Yaakov Avinu had a different plan. Shimon and Levi, Achim, Kele Hamas, Mecherotehem, Kele Hamas Mecherotem, Shimon and Levi are carrying the skills and the art and the profession of murderers. Murderers. You stole the Omanut of Isav and you are murderers. Wow. Besodam said Yaakov, Al Tavo Nafshi. is cursing them. Not them, not them, but their traits and characteristics. Yaakov Avinu is telling them who they are and how much he feels that they have to understand their traits and characteristics. Forget about future. Let me tell you what I think about you. And uh, after Reuven got his lecture, Shimon and Levi got their lecture. Now Yehuda was next. Look at what Rashi Kadosh said, Yehuda, when Yehuda was called, when Yehuda was listening to what Yaakov Avinu is doing, Yehuda started to listen to, to the Tochaha that Yaakov Avinu is giving to Reuven and then Shimon and Levi. It hit Yehuda lisog la'achorav. And Yehuda started to pull back. He said, this is not for me. Look what he did to Reuven, Shimon and Levi. I'm next. I have the story with Tamar. I have a story also in my pocket. I have a story. In my, I have luggage too. If this is what he did to Reuven, Shimon and Levi, Yaakov Avinu is now going to do it to me. He started to go backwards from fear. But Yaakov Avinu gave him a different lecture. Yehuda, ata Yehudu charachecha. Yehuda, you are not like them. Yehuda, lo ata kemotem. You are not like them. You are different. Ata Yehudu charachecha. You were born for leadership. You're going to be the king. Okay. Moreover, Abutai, the question is more than obvious. Yaakov Avinu is making a huge promise to the sons, to his children, and he's telling them, I am going to tell you the future. I'm going to tell you the future. And not only he's not telling them the future, he's telling them completely something else. So Yaakov Avinu, if you want to tell them the future, tell them the future. If you don't want to tell them the future, why are you making that promise to tell them the future and in the end you rebuke and criticize them? What is it that Yaakov Avinu is actually doing? And you remember at the very beginning what I said that the moment Yaakov Avinu, the moment Yaakov Avinu is speaking before he passed away, this is the most precious moment that the brothers are listening. So what is he telling them? And we also have the question of what Yaakov Avinu did with Yosef, telling him that he is not, that he is apologizing for what he did with Rahel and not taking her to Eretz Israel as well. I want to share with you, to understand that, this is really, really powerful. But what I want to share with you, it's a quick introduction to this point, and I wish, I wish we all can take it to life in such a beautiful way, if we understand that, even though it's not too easy again to digest, but nevertheless, it's very, very powerful. You know, that in our Jewish practices, 
of blessings of Berachot. We have many different kinds of Berachot. One of the Berachot that we have, blessings that we have, are called Birkot Anenin. Birkot Anenin are the Berachot that we recite before we eat and after we eat food. Birkot Anenin, you take a glass of water, you get a holy coffee, and you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Nukhen Melech HaOlam, Sheakol Nihia Bidvaro. Which basically a lot of people believe that making a beracha on a glass of water is thanking Akadosh Baruch Hu for the water. That's not true. The reason why we say beracha birkot aneinim, it's basically is to ask permission from Borei Olam to drink something that belongs to him. As the Gemara said, Masechet Berachot, anybody who is eating or drinking without a beracha is just a thief. Gazlan, because it's not yours. So when you take it and you say, you're asking permission from a Kadosh Baruch Hu to drink the, the water, the coffee, or whatever the kind of food we have. We're not going to go into this, but just in general. We also have Brachot that we call under the category of Birkat Mitzvot. Birkat Mitzvot is the Brachot that we make before we fulfill a Mitzvah, before you put the filin, say, Asher Kiddushanu. And whatever. But we have many mitzvot before we do the mitzvah, we say the biracha. Okay, so that's a general idea of birachot that we all probably know very well. But there is, in the Jewish world, we also have a very unique biracha that we recite at the highest moment of joy. Anytime we are extremely happy because of specific occasion, or even when we buy a new suit, or whatever kind of joyful like Yom Tov, etc. When we have a moment of joy, we have a very special beracha that is reflecting on our joy and happiness and and greatness and gratitude and appreciation to Borei Olam is the beracha. The, the beracha is known as Birkat Shehiyanu. What is Birkat Shehiyanu? Birkat Shehiyanu is a beracha that we say, "Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokenu Melech Haolam, Shehiyanu veKiyemanu veGiyanu leZeman Ze." Great. You're praising Borei Olam that brought us to life and kept us alive to experience this moment of joy. Incredible. This is the moment of joy, of happiness. However, Rabotai, on the completely other side of the spectrum of life, there is another Beracha that we also say in special occasions, but the exact opposite of feelings from joy and happiness. And this is the kind of beracha we say in the deepest moment of sadness, sorrow, pain. And usually when somebody has v'shalom, passed away, a family member, at the graveside, in the funeral, we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Melokenu Melech HaOlam, Dayan HaEmet. Dayan HaEmet is the Beracha of Avelim, moment of pain, sorrow, sadness, painful moment. We say Dayan HaEmet. Dayan HaEmet means we are accepting the judgment, the truth, the truthful judgment of Borei Olam. It's a very easy beracha to speak about, very difficult moment to say it. May we shall never know from that experience. But nevertheless, it's part of life. So we have on one side of the spectrum the most joyful moment. We say, Shehayanu, when you are extremely happy. And Has Shalom on the other side of the spectrum is where we are sad and upset, and not upset, but maybe upset too, but when we are sad and in pain, say Baruch Dayan Aymet. Happiness, sadness. T 
two complete extreme sides of the spectrum of life. Believe it or not, do you know that there is one moment, this is a mind-boggling concept, please bear with me on that. You know there is one moment in life, one circumstance in life, one situation in life, one scenario in life that a human being is required to say those two berachot, one after the other, right away, back to back. There is a moment in life it's impossible to believe. But there is a moment in life that a person might find himself in a requirement of saying those two berachot, the happiest one and the saddest one, one after the other. Do you know when it is? When is this? Do you know when these two berachot are meeting the same person? There is a halakha. And I remember when I saw it at the very beginning, I could not believe myself. But the message is super powerful. There is one moment that there is mentioned in Halakha. Mi shemet lo aviv. A person lost his father. Lo aleinu ba A person lost his father. Omer, you should say the biracha, baruch dayan ha'emet. It makes sense. He said the biracha, but I don't have it. Veiminiya halo yerusha, and if the father left him fifty million dollars, he should say at that moment, "Baruch ata Hashem elokenu melech haolam." It's hard to believe, huh? Shehiyanu bekiyemanu veigianu azeman ze. Baruch Dayana emit for the loss. Shehiyanu for gaining the money. Now I don't want you to try it. <laughs> I don't want you to try it. But if you do, if you do, go to someone. Imagine, imagine the scenario. Imagine somebody lost his father. No Alan. And his Avel is walking after the after the Aaron of his father, the, the Levaya, and he's sad, he's crying. He's really Avel, Vahafuyosh. And you go to him, imagine yourself, imagine you go to him and whisper to his ears. Hello? Say Shehayanu. Shehayanu? Yeah! Your father left you $50 million. You should be happy. What do you think would be the usual reaction of people at that moment? I bet you people will look at you and say, what are you talking about? Do you think I care about $50 million? Do you think I care about money? Do you think life is about money? This is all about my father. My father passed away and I'm so sad and I'm crying and I'm mourning and I'm this and I'm that. I don't care about the money. Hachamim Rabotai comes to this person, looks straight to his face in the moment of pain and sorrow and say, liar. Liar. Hachamim who knew the inner being of Nefesh Adam. They knew the real nefesh, the real traits and characteristic of nefesh Adam. They knew deep down you're happy. You can lie to the world. You can tell the world whatever you want, whatever sounds great, whatever sounds acceptable. Now you are suffering. Now you're in pain. But deep down in your heart, you are happy that you have $15 million. Not that you're happy why you got the $50 million. Has v'shalom. We don't suspect that. But is there a possibility to find in a human soul 
a spark of joy. Even in that moment, because of 50 million dollars, Hachamim said yes. Nefesh Adam Rabotai. Nefesh Adam Rabotai is a very, very big complex. Hachamim had the power to understand Nefesh Adam in the thinnest part of it. And even if it doesn't sound super romantic, even if it doesn't sound super acceptable to admit, nevertheless, it is the truth. Nefesh Adam is a complex that if you understand that, if you understand what we are made of, if we understand our trade and characteristics, we can get light to our lives. And yes, even if it sounds a little strange to admit that the person is happy at that moment, not happy that his father passed away, but is there a spark of happiness? Is there a little laser point of joy inside his heart? The answer is, let's be honest and truthful and understand. Yes, there is. When Yaakov Avinu, when Yaakov Avinu goes to Yosef, when Yaakov Avinu goes to Yosef, and he says, I want you to bury me in Enet Israel. Al na tikbereni b'Mitzrayim. I don't want you to bury me in Egypt. Please take me to Eretz Israel. Yaakov Avinu knew that as great as Sadiq, as Yosef, as the greatest son, Ben Zekunim Ulo, Yosef Sadiq will do anything for his father. Yaakov Avinu went with the knife of a surgeon into the heart of Yosef and dug deep, deep, deep until it's painful. And he dug with the knife of the heart surgery into the soul of Yosef Sadiq and he said, I know that somewhere deep in your soul you're carrying a little complain. Maybe you're not comfortable. I didn't do it to Rahel. Maybe there is something deep there. Dad, you suspect I will not do what you want? Yes. And moreover, Botei, even if I am completely mistaken about Yosef HaTzadik, it is a great lesson for us. It is a great lesson for us to be able to dig in into our own souls, in our own neshamot, in our own traits and characteristics, and to be able to face the truth of who we are. And to face the truth of what kind of beliefs and midot we are carrying in life. Because our midot and our beliefs are basically creating the kind of life we have. It's not a rocket science. But what Yaakov Avinu is telling the sons, what Yaakov Avinu is telling the sons, he said to them, "Me'asefu ve'agida lachem et asher ikra etchem be'aharit hayamim." Nachon? "Me'asefu ve'agida lachem et asher ikra etchem be'aharit hayamim." What does that mean? Come and I will tell you. Come and I will tell you what's going to happen in your future. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in your future. And instead of telling them what's going to happen in their future, he is defining them. Yaakov Avinu, instead of telling them the beautiful stories of their future, what's going to happen to them, he chose 
to tell them who they are. Who they are in their traits and characteristics. Shimon ve Leviahim, kele Hamas mecheotehem. Reuven, pahaz kamay maltota, you should know yourself. Why? If Yaakov Avinu wanted to tell them their future, why are you telling them who they are? But I know that by now, the answer is simple. Yaakov Avinu is giving the $10 billion secret to life. If you want to know your future, get to know yourself. Because who you are will determine and will create your future. Moreover, if a person knows that he has a specific trait, if a person, I'll give you a quick example, which is very, very simple. There are many people in the world that we call them, we're not going to go into details, we call them takers. There are people in this world that really, truly, deeply believe that they were born to this world to enjoy. They were born to this world to accept and to get things. They are all about immediate gratification and then whatever they can get pleasures for themselves. They are the center of the world and the world was created to serve them. However, if a person lives his entire life with this belief, with this belief, with that belief, if somebody is running his entire life on this trade and belief system, how do you think his marriage will be like? What do you think, what kind of a marriage this person will have? Where he is into the marriage, dying day in and day out, how to get pleasures and how to receive joy and with zero willingness of giving or serving others. Somebody that his entire life, his entire philosophy is, whenever he meets any human being, there is only one question on the table. And the question is, what can I get from you? How am I going to benefit from your existence? If there is no benefit from you, please get away from my way and let me look for somebody who can provide something to me. But when someone has this kind of attitude, what kind of marriage is going to have? What kind of parenting and raising kids system is going to have? What kind of business is going to have? What kind of relationships it will have with people in the world? And he can blame the entire world being a victim, take the violin and play at depression songs in the end of the day. Look into yourself. Buy a mirror and see who you are. If somebody who is an angry human being full of anger and arrogancy and every single thing that in his life doesn't work the way he wants if he runs his life in a way that anybody who is not dancing on his own music he's gonna hear from him in a very harsh and terrible way if somebody knows that he has the trait of anger an angry person anything that doesn't go in his way He's going to break glasses and plates and scream and yell and curse. But what kind of future this person is going to have? And it's not a rocket science. You know the person. You know his future. You know what are the traits and characteristics and belief system of this person. You know exactly what kind of life he's going to have. If you ever speak to someone, if you ever speak to someone... And, he's telling him, and you're telling him how is life. And he said, ah, I had better days. Life is very difficult. And da, 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 da. My business doesn't work. My relationship don't work. And nothing works in my life. And you say, really? Why is that? Why your relationship don't work? Why your panasa don't work? Why you don't have enough money to live? Oh, you don't understand. Let me tell you. Do you know why panasa doesn't work? I'm not rich. Look, I didn't have the education. I was not born to the right family. And Bichlal, you know, America is very difficult. California is very expensive. And I don't have this and I don't have that. My parents never taught me anything. And he is going and running and blaming the entire world. This is bad. This is bad. It's because of this guy, because of those parents, because of this economy, because of the weather, because of Obama, because of God knows what. 
and he is a center of depression because the whole world is at blame. We call this person a victim or if you wish, a powerless human being. Any human being on the planet that believes that the entire world is at fault for his failure is doomed to fail for the rest of life. You don't need to be a prophet to know their future. Just listen to the way they speak. Listen to the way people speak. You'll know everything about their lives. If you are sensitive and you have the skill of active listening, it's very powerful, yet very simple. If somebody knows how to blame the world for his failure and there is zero accountability and responsibility on your own actions and you don't understand your role as a creator of this mess of your life, you have no future. You will determine and create your future based on the way you behave and the way you carry your belief system. Yaakov Avinu Alav Shalom is telling the sons, Yasefu, Vagida Lachem, et Asherikra, et Chem, Baharita Yamim. Let me share with you your future. Do you know how I am going to share with you your future? By defining you, by sharing with you, by putting a mirror to your face who you are. Now, what are you going to do with this piece of information? It's completely up to you. If you know who you are, and you want a different result of what you have now, work on yourself. And a botai, there is no shame to work on ourselves. If somebody knows he's an angry human being, go be treated. Go work on yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you know that you are arrogant human being or you're a stingy human being and you have all kinds of beliefs that don't serve your life, Go take care of it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with taking care of our weaknesses or any, any areas of life. We are seeking improvement. Build your life by understanding who you are. Stop blaming the world. There's no point to it. Unless you really enjoy it and you enjoy the results of it, that's fine. Other than that, understand you have the power by understanding who you are to determine and create the kind of life you want. To conclude this point, I'm going to share with you a quick story I've heard many years ago that I think has an incredible power to illustrate metaphorically the point that we're making in this week's parasha. The story goes about this man who was very, very old and very poor, yet very wise. This guy was a homeless, was an 80 years old, extremely, extremely wise person, genius guy, yet homeless, very, very, very poor. So he was sitting on the street trying to make a few bucks just to survive one day at a time. In his neighborhood, there was a little kid who was a little mischief. This little kid was an eight years old kid. He was a little troublemaker. And he heard that in the neighborhood, there is this old yet very wise homeless person. So he said, as a little troublemaker, he said, I'm going to test this guy to see if he's truly wise or it's just what people say about him and it's not true. So what he did was, he took two butterflies. He took two butterflies, alive butterflies, and he put them in his hands and he closed his hands. Slowly but surely, he walked in the neighborhood to find this old, homeless, wise man. And he goes to him and he said, Grandpa, I heard that you are very wise men. I heard you're a very smart person. 
So I want to ask you a question to see if you're really, really smart. And the old man looked at him with a brilliant smile and he said, what can I do for you? He said, Saba, I have in my hands two butterflies. I want you to look at my hands covered and tell me if those butterflies are alive or dead. He figured in his eyes, in his mind, that whatever this old man would say, he can prove him wrong. Because if he would say that they are dead, he will open his hands and he will let them out. He will let them free. And if he's going to say they are alive, he's going to squeeze them and basically kill them and open his hands and prove this old man wrong. And he's holding his hands, goes to this man and he said, tell me, are those butterflies are alive or they're dead? This wise elder person looked at him and he said, my little kid, the life of the butterflies are in your hands. What are they? you will determine. My dear brothers and sisters, if there is any message that I want to convey to you today, but I, we need to understand that we have power to create the most powerful and beautiful life Boy Olam gave us. We are so blessed. We are so fortunate. If we only pay attention to the gratitude, to the blessings, to the greatness Boy Olam gave us and make use of it and really develop it to the most beautiful life. And if we only being brave enough to get to know who we are and we are deeply aware of our traits and characteristics and being very, very sensitive and mindful about our traits and characteristics and belief systems. And we will start to analyze what serves us and what's not. We will be able to determine and create the kind of life we were born to live. Yaakov Avino is telling his sons, you want to create a future, understand who you are. Because who you are will determine the future. Shabbat shalom to all of you.